This is the Georgia Farm Monitor. Since 1966, your source for state and national agribusiness news and features for farmers and consumers about Georgia's number one industry, agriculture. The Georgia Farm Monitor is produced by the state's largest general farm organization, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now, here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. Hi there, thanks for tuning in. As always, happy to bring you all the latest agribusiness news and features from the great state of Georgia. This is the Farm Monitor. I'm Ray D'Alessio. And I'm Kenny Bergamy. If you're new to the show, here's how it works. Coming up, it's the birth of a new feature at the Georgia National Fair, literally. John Holcomb reports on the excitement surrounding the very popular baby barn. Also on the program, after nine years at the state FFA level, why Chip Bridges decided to return to his roots in Lumpkin County. And then later, combating white flies, each year they cost producers millions of dollars in revenue. But rest assured, researchers at UGA are working harder than ever to find a solution to the problem. These stories and so much more start right now on the Farm Monitor. Each year, the Georgia National Fair tries to add something new. This year, they did just that by adding the Georgia Grown Baby Barn, a center that lets the public experience the live births of farm animals. The monitor's John Holcomb has the story of how the barn came to be and the goal behind it. After more than a year of planning and four and a half months of construction, the Georgia Grown Baby Barn was open to those at the Georgia National Fair. It was a long process that was started about six years ago by the Georgia Department of Agriculture. Had opportunity to be at one of my national meetings in Iowa and we saw what Iowa had done and we came back and immediately just shared part of the, started developing the vision with the authority. After getting it approved in the Georgia General Assembly, they started working with those in the cattle industry and decided to go with dairy cows to be placed in the barn. If you think about the reason dairy cattle are a natural fit, dairy cattle are very competent in, in loud noises. There, there's the feed truck, there's the alley cleaner, there's all these things and the constant commotion that goes on at a dairy farm where they're three time a day milking process. So these cattle are, as you can well see, if you look around this room now and see them, they're not excited about anything. They worked with the UGA vet school to make sure they had cows lined up to give birth every single day of the fair. Each of these the cattle will be in, most likely be induced every day, so we have them, have them stacked up. A great team of people have been, been working behind the scenes. The barn has stands for viewing that can hold about a thousand people, and monitors that hang from the ceiling where viewers can watch the action go down, proving what the facility was built for, and that was to educate the public on this aspect of the agriculture industry. This is a big communication opportunity. That's what this is all about, giving this life experience to, to the, the public who generally is not around agriculture. The exhibit also serves another purpose, the purpose of sparking people's interest. There is a, 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 a subliminal aspect of this that Wow, can a, can a young person actually come here and for the first time experience agriculture and maybe choose agriculture as a career? Maybe go on to be a Farm Bureau insurance agent. Maybe maybe work in the Federation Services or, or be one of our inspectors or go out and work in industry. All because of the experience they had in, 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 this, this, uh, in this baby barn uh, uh, extravaganza. Each year, the fair hosts more than 500,000 people. I asked what the number of expectations were for the new exhibit, but they can't even guess after what happened before the fair even opened. We had a cow give birth, not prematurely, on her schedule yesterday before the fair opened. Simply fair employees, vendors at the fair, the crowd was three people deep wanting to get that experience. So if that's the experience, nobody broadcast it. What are we expecting with the fair with announcements and push notifications over their fair's app? We're going to see crowds that are just going to be astronomical. As for future plans, this is just the beginning. We expect in future years probably to add some other, other species in here. To, to But to, step by step, we're going, to, we're going to grow this effort. And I believe it will be the best uh, Above, perhaps one of the best public outreach from behalf of, of all of agriculture that maybe this state's ever seen. Reporting in Perry for the Farm Monitor, I'm John Holcomb. All right, thank you, John. Staying in Perry, the Georgia Junior National Livestock Show brings 4-H and FFA students from all over the state together to compete in the state's largest event. 
It gives them a chance to showcase all their hard work as well as give a face to Georgia agriculture to all those in attendance. Damon Jones has the story. Every year, hundreds of thousands of people from all over the country make their way to Perry for the Georgia National Fair. It's an opportunity for them to enjoy music, games, and plenty of fried foods, as well as get an up-close look at Georgia agriculture. What we hope to do here is to educate people. You know, we, we really like to bring in that agricultural component here at the fair. Of course, you know, when you go to any fair across the state and across the country, you're going to see, of course, your carnival rides, get to eat all the delicious fair food, but we also want to educate people on agriculture. We feel like it's really important to give all of our fairgoers, everybody, a, um, an opportunity to get a real-life agricultural experience. We don't need to assume that just because they're maybe from middle Georgia or from south Georgia or from anywhere in the state or across the country that may come to our fair that they know about agriculture. And as usual, the showcase event is the Junior National Livestock Show, where 4-H and FFA members put months of hard work on display in the state's biggest competition. You know, those youth work year-round on those um, exhibits, and they bring in that livestock to really showcase. And this is what we call the Super Bowl of championships for them. This is kind of the, the epitome of what they want to win for the year, and we're just really excited. We're looking forward to a great year with them. Thanks to the partnership with Georgia Farm Bureau, these students are competing for more than just a trophy, as there is a nice cash prize at stake as well. And this year, there is more of an emphasis on the showmanship aspect of the event. We've been lucky enough to partner with Farm Bureau, and they have really invested in our youth livestock uh, program. And uh, we have chosen to take a bulk of that um, prize money that they're given and put it into showmanship. And the reason that we chose showmanship and partnered with Farm Bureau on showmanship is because it's a, it's a reward for the students' work with the animal. A reward that is well-deserved as these students and parents sacrifice time and money for their projects each and every day. We're two and a half to three hours in the barn every night right now, especially preparing for that. And so um, it's important that we teach youth that if you work hard and you, and you put, you invest money and you invest time, that there is reward at the end of it. It's not just prize money this partnership provides as Georgia Farm Bureau supports these youth events every step of the way. It is year round that we have something going on and we are so appreciative of them not only supporting the fairgrounds but the youth livestock projects. They're in those barns, they're shaking the hands of those kids, they're really becoming involved. Not only do these projects teach students responsibility, but it also provides an opportunity for parents to stay involved in their children's lives on a daily basis. There's nothing, another project that you would get involved with your family that, that almost forces you to have family time together every night. Um, we are responsible for an animal being alive. We're responsible for the daily care of this animal. So we have to talk together uh, and work together, and we have conversations about this uh, livestock uh, every night. There is going to be a cost and a financial um, investment for those parents, but I tell you, there is not one parent in that barn over there that regrets the money that they spend on that livestock project. Reporting from the Georgia National Fairgrounds, I'm Damon Jones for the Farm Monitor. Damon, thank you so much. And hey, the fun doesn't end there. Now it's on to Sunbelt Expo 2018, North America's premier farm show, October 16th through the 18th, as we do every year. The monitor will be there and we'll have a full report in the weeks that follow. Meantime, if you're looking for a really good read or maybe you have a passion for history, here's something you're going to want to check out. Historic Rural Churches of Georgia presents 47 early houses of worship from all areas of the state. Both the book and website feature photographs capturing the elegance of these sanctuaries and their surrounding grounds and cemeteries. You can purchase a copy for yourself at Amazon.com. When we come back, for nine years he served as the Georgia Ag Ed Program Manager and State FFA Advisor. Now Chip Bridges has a new role and new goals. Also, hear how this nasty little creature wreaked havoc on pumpkin growers this year and what one local producer said about choosing the right pumpkin for you. Hello everyone, I'm Agricultural Secretary Sonny Perdue and I want to thank each and every U.S. producer who responded to the 2017 Census of Agriculture this year. Our motto at USDA is to do right and feed everyone. Conducting the Census of Agriculture is part of our commitment to you. Your response helps show the great value of U.S. agriculture. 
The data will help inform decisions about ag education, research, farm programs, rural development, and much more over the next several years. We know that your time is valuable and your voice, your information will help shape your future. Look for Census of Agriculture results in this coming February. From all of us at USDA, thank you again for your participation. I have been here for two months now. I started the, my job after serving uh, 13 years on the state staff of Georgia's Agriculture Education Program. I was very fortunate to get to come back to the place where I started my career 29 years ago. Uh, when I graduated from the University of Georgia with an Ag Ed degree, my first job was in Lumpkin County. And I taught here for eight years. And every move I've made since then, I've always thought, man, I would love to retire from Lumpkin County. I, I, I need to start out by saying I really enjoyed my time with the state agriculture education uh, staff of Georgia and serving as the state FFA advisor. Uh, it was an incredible opportunity and experience for me. I learned a lot. I, worked, I got to work with some great people. Uh, but the thing I missed the most on a day-to-day -day basis was the, uh, the connection with students uh, in the classroom and the day-to-day -day connection with students. Our future agriculturalists will come through these programs and so it teaches them skills that's going to make them successful whatever they do in the future. If, you know, they, they may not necessarily want to have a job working with animals, but the responsibility that they learn, the knowledge they gain by leadership and dedication to following through with a task. Anything we do in here will make them successful. There's actually a shortage of agriculture teachers and so uh, the need for ag teachers is, is as, as important today as it has ever been. Uh, the agriculture education programs continue to grow. We have to be sustainable in the future and so the need for agriculture teachers is very, very critical and very important. And the thing I love about teaching ag is that you don't have to do the same thing every day. It's something different every day. Uh, you know, you can, you can be working in the greenhouse, you can be working with animals, you can be working on a leadership activity. Uh, the day-to-day -day work of an ag teacher it is, is a, it's a tough job, but it's rewarding because you don't have to do the same thing every day, and you get to fit the student's interest with just about anything in agriculture. There's, I always tell my students, there's something for everybody in agriculture. Well, you never know it by the recent heat wave here in Georgia, but a check of the calendar, you'll notice that Halloween is just a matter of days away. So I'm guessing right about now, many of you are out there searching for that ideal pumpkin to put your cutting and carving skills to good use. That's why today I'm at the pumpkin patch at Yule Forest in Stockbridge, Georgia, talking to somebody who's been producing high quality pumpkins for close to 40 years. There is the perfect pumpkin for that person. Uh, God didn't make every pumpkin the same. Uh, there are different sizes and different colors and different shapes and and it just is what appeals to you and it depends on what you want to do with a pumpkin. Uh, everybody thinks in terms of a jack-o'-lantern kind of pumpkin and uh, for carving and putting a funny face on or something but you can get pumpkins just for decoration from color and uh, you can also uh, select pumpkins that are just for cooking and uh, so it depends on what you want to do and as far as the perfect pumpkin uh, it's what your personal favorite is. I raise typically two acres of pumpkins and that's uh, usually between two and 4,000 pumpkins. Uh, this particular season, we started out really well in the summertime. The, uh, we had a lot of rainfall. It was just timely once a week. Uh, pumpkins got off to a great start. Uh, of course, it got dry and uh, we do irrigate. Uh, but I guess this year, the biggest problem we had and all of Georgia really had the issue is uh, we had a huge aphid infestation. And aphids, just to kind of cut to the chase on it, aphids are a very tiny bug and they spread what's called mosaic virus and it deteriorates the vine. Uh, we do spray for the pest, but you cannot keep up with it. Uh, I don't care how long you spray. Uh, we're on a, one, a weekly spray program uh, for the mold and mildew in the pumpkin vines and for the aphids. Uh, but this year they really just kind of overtook it. And so we do have uh, a great pumpkin crop, but it could have been better. 
uh, and I've talked to some other growers that are farther south here and uh, they had aphid problems too in their cucumbers and in watermelons. In addition to growing pumpkins, Alan has another unique gift. Trust me when I say the man has a knack for scaring the living daylights out of people. It's an all year kind of thing. Uh, Fear the Woods uh, is bigger and better this year. Uh, the uh, pandemic uh, uh, combat zone is bigger and uh, where everybody gets to shoot monsters and zombies. Uh, and the, the, the terror transport we call the Annihilator uh, is longer and better. And uh, the trail through the woods is longer and better. We are an actor base haunt. Uh, we do have a lot of animatronics, uh, which are really cool, uh, but we're an actor base haunt. Uh, a lot of haunts don't do that, and that really gives our haunt a special character. Uh, we're outside, about 80% of our haunt is outside, so you're in the deep woods no matter what you do. And so that in itself is scary, and uh, you put our actors in there, and we do a lot of actor training, uh, and they're pretty awesome. They're pretty awesome. Really neat place, and hey, if you want to learn all about pumpkins and the different varieties, log on to the Farm Monitor Facebook page. Alan Grant was kind enough to film a little demonstration for us, uh, kind of like humans. No two pumpkins are exactly alike. Again, Pumpkin Ed 101 airing now on the Farm Monitor Facebook page. Well, if you're wondering where's fall, you're not alone. After the break, hear from a forestry expert who says the peak season for foliage is now happening later in the year. Well, 2017 was just an outbreak year for white flies in cotton, a devastating pest. So in some cases, you'll have 100% crop loss. Yellow squash, we were probably close to, you know, 80% losses in the fall. This was, it was a brand new problem for many, many folks. In cotton, it was a $100 an acre pest. We've got to do something to corral these white flies. If we don't, our vegetable industry is going to be gone. In 17, instead of 388,000, we packed 88,000 boxes of squash. So it's a dr dramatic uh, decrease in production. Agriculture as a whole, and farmers in particular, look to our college, look to the University of Georgia for answers and solutions. Of course, we start with our county agent, Scott Carlson, and we, we call him out to the fields, and then we get all the specialists out to the field. Extension has a huge role in understanding this problem and taking this problem to the administrators, to the uh, basic scientists, and to other specialists so that we can get those people on board to work on this common problem. We've had some successes on looking at uh, resistance to some of these viruses, and so some of the tactics that the farmers are doing um, when there's an older crop in the field, they're destroying that crop so it doesn't serve as a reservoir for white flies. Um, they're being very diligent on scouting and control, and they're also st starting to look at more resistant varieties. Our, our research focuses on work that's done in the field, as well as in the greenhouse and in the lab, but we also focus on developing a holistic strategy to combat this problem that's plaguing Georgia's growers. So it's really a um, kind of an interdisciplinary approach uh, that ourselves and the farmers are taking. With regards to management options, we do not have much. White flies are one of the most complex pests that we deal with. We've got a very short life cycle. That life cycle can be as short as 15 days up to about 30 days. And so in 15 days, you can have an entire new generation. Uh, they'll mate within just a few hours of emerging and the next females will start laying eggs within 24 hours. And then a very wide host range, that means that they can reproduce on a great number of both agronomic crops as well as non-agronomic crops. They also transmit plant diseases, so there's a plant disease component as well that we have to tackle. They can transmit viruses, the two important viruses, namely cucurbit leaf crumple virus and cucurbit yellowstone disorder virus. And so it just takes one white fly to transmit a, a lethal virus virus to our vegetable crop. And so there's no insecticide that would allow you to control absolutely 100%. At present, we've got three different classes of insecticides that work. We're primarily relying on insect growth regulators. 
Um, they are very effective, but under extremely high population density, uh, that may not be enough uh, management to uh, avoid economic losses. The best option for managing Wi-Fi transmitted viruses rolled over is to use resistance. And this would apply as an alternative to insecticides. And that would be the, probably the silver bullet, if we could say that. But we're at least five to ten years away from doing such a thing. We already have white flies now. So we're, we're, we're right back in it again, trying to control these viruses and everything. The new technologies, new innovations that are developed in very basic research laboratories, eventually we have to put all that together and come up with a workable program or a workable plan, a strategy. In terms of dealing with this problem, we've got great support in terms of our growers helping us, our administrators helping us, as well as our great research team that we have. Wherever there is a challenge, there is an opportunity. So now this is an opportunity for us to solve this issue, and this, this is a kind of motivation for us too. Finally this week, if you're ready for some fall foliage, you may have to wait a little while longer. Yeah, researchers say the peak season for autumn colors happening later and later, usually stretching to November. Charles Denny explores why that may be the case and shows you how it's usually worth the wait. This video was shot last fall, just days before Thanksgiving. The autumn colors were beautiful around Knoxville. It just seemed to take a while for them to get here. As for 2018, early predictions are for most of Tennessee to have a spectacular fall color-wise. For a leaf color to occur to get the vibrant colors, you want to be someplace in between. You don't want to have too much rain or too little rain. Wayne Clatterbuck with the UT Institute of Agriculture says conditions are shaping up across the state for a nice fall. In Wayne's world, for the best colors, you want warm sunny days and cool nights. When it comes to foliage, Clatterbuck says Tennessee is right up there with any state in the nation. Yeah, we have, you know, more than 80 different species of hardwood trees, and each species has its own little pattern, so it all comes together in a mosaic, if that's the best way of putting it, to give you that vibrant color. We'll have some trees that uh, turn color earlier, and we'll have some trees that turn color later. So how much later? Happy birthday to me, I'll turn a year older, October 20th. Feel free to celebrate accordingly. But I also point that date out because October 20th used to just about be the peak time for foliage in Tennessee. Nowadays, in the past it used to be peak color, seemed to be the Alabama football weekend, but it's about, it's delayed at least in the lower elevations about a week or so and it's getting to be Peak color is like Halloween and into the first week of November now, especially in the valleys. Clatterbuck says we've experienced climate variability, warmer temperatures later in fall, and the leaves are responding. But a late fall and longer viewing season is a good thing, especially when it comes to tourism in the Smokies, where color happens earlier in higher elevations. In Tennessee, it's pretty neat because uh, you'll have a long time for leaf color if you are willing to go from different elevations and so forth. When a leaf changes color, technically it's dying, but what a spectacular finale. Color is coming, just be patient. This is Charles Denny reporting. Charles, thank you so much. That's gonna do it for this week's edition of the Farm Monitor. Here's a reminder for all the latest ag info regarding food, great recipes, and what's happening down on the farm. Be sure you check out our Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest pages. You'll stay informed and see what's up in the world of farming and with us on the show. Take care, everybody. We will see you next week right here on the Farm Monitor. As always, have a great week.